As a Westerner, you've likely have heard of Zen or Zen Buddhism, but what is it exactly and what does it mean to you and should you actually practice this form of Buddhism? Well, when we say Zen, we're talking about the Japanese word for something called Dhyana. So Dhyana stems all the way back to ancient India where Buddhism was practiced and it means everything from meditation, meditative concentration or concentration or nuanced level of different things. Specifically, it's referencing really peering inside the mind to actually control attainment and actually gain Buddhahood through that. So it's this form of concentration we're doing that's revealing our true nature, revealing the truth so we become Buddhas. So let's take a, a step back and go all the way back to the time of the Buddha and start the story right. There is a sermon in Buddhism called the Flower Sermon. And this is really, we can kind of think about it as maybe the beginnings of this meditation school. So the Buddha was having the sermon. He was sitting, he had all his monastics around him, but unlike his other sermons, he wasn't actually saying anything. He held up a flower and was throwing it around and everyone's looking at him and looking at this flower and not really understanding what's going on. It was very unusual. But there was one monastic, one monk all the way in the back who saw this and started to smile. And so the Buddha recognized this and he basically said he got it. He understood what I'm, I'm showing here. And so this is sort of like really the beginning of this dhyana and it's really this, this form that uh, of teaching practice that's outside of the scripture. So it's not really bound by the written word, word. it's this mind to mind transmission of the teachings, the practice, etc. And so this monk got it. We can really think about that, that monk as really being the, the first in a lineage of different Diana masters and, and teachers when it comes to this. So this is something that's really not necessarily unusual in Buddhism, but very special. So it really stemmed and started off this new sort of practice, still rooted in the Buddhist tradition, but it's really focused on peering inside the mind, this direct mind to mind transmission that's outside of the, the scriptures, if you will, that leads us towards Buddhahood. So as the schools in ancient India were progressing, you know, we're now we're way past where, where the Buddha passed into Parinirvana, he, he passed away. So now we have always multiple schools, right? And so some were actually practicing this in, in various different ways. And this is also the time where you start to see the transmission of Buddha uh, or Buddhism, excuse me, outside of really ancient India and the the region right there where it's kind of going up to Central Asia where like for example Tibet's at but more importantly is going over to China and so as it's going over to China Buddhism we get to see this transmission occurring but then later on there's this figure called Bodhidharma so some say he wasn't a real figure at all but he came from Central Asia and he came and he's sometimes known as the first patriarch uh, and this lineage as it starts in China for what we call Chan. And so Chan is the, is the form of Buddhism that we, we call it inside China, but it was actually called Channa. And so Channa is the Chinese word for Dhyana. And so this is really kind of like where our our story begins for East Asian Buddhism as it refers to this practice. And so this is the very interesting portion uh, of Buddhism that's really caught the imagination, this, this Zen, all throughout the world, right? So w when it's going into China, not just really this Dhyana that became Chana, and eventually this got shortened to, ch to Chan, but Buddhism in general is really looked at as foreign influence, right? But we're, I'm focusing more on this Dhyana that became Chan. And so what's really interesting, like what is one of the major religions or belief systems in, inside China? It was Taoism. And so there's a lot of debate uh, all over regarding, all right, how much of Dhyana that became Chan inside China has been shaped or changed by Taoism? And so 
I, I don't want to say there's like a 100% black and white answer to this, but think about it this way. I think this is a good way to kind of explain it also as it spread throughout the, the rest of East Asia, that Chan grew up in the world that was kind of predominated by Taoism and, and other types of belief systems. And so you had some of the first monastics, Chan masters and Chan monks, were actually Taoists who became Buddhists. And so a lot of times you have these teachings and everything else, and they may have used the verbiage and the words that they understood and they use in Taoism. And also you get to see where subtle differences are starting to actually occur. I think out of all of them, like probably the, the one that I, I hone in on is where you have the, the daily practice, if you will, the not being separated from daily activities, the world, etc. A little bit different than you might have saw in ancient India, where Dhyana was also practiced, but it was really more, you were kind of secluded, right? Whereas here, it's like, no, you know, you need to go ahead and till the garden as a monk. You know, you have to interact with the lady, you have to be, you know, out, out in the world, essentially. So basically, this concentration, meditative concentration school, whatever you want to call it, was not so different, not so separated from our everyday activities. And so this was maybe a little influence you get from Taoism into there, along with different types of meditation and stuff like that. I think a key part before we kind of continue, these are two separate things. So Chan and, and Buddhism is different than Taoism. It is, there, there's absolutely separation between the two. Just for example, a monastic, a monk or nun inside a, a Chan or, or Buddhism, they shave their heads, they're usually vegetarian inside China, and they are celibate, whereas you look at a, a Taoist, <laughs> the complete opposite. So you have this dif differentiation between the two, so they're not the same. It's not where Taoism changed Buddhism, and specifically Chan, into its own thing. Maybe some influences, you know, this and that. I think a good thing when we talk about Buddhism, Buddhism can adapt to pretty much any culture, but the core of Buddhism is always there and is shaped by the, the culture and society around it to be able to be practiced and understood and everything else, right? So I think you might have had a little bit of that, but they're absolutely two fundamentally different things. So another part of this, as it, it grew inside China, you also have all these different temples and everything. And so this is gonna be a little bit different than you might find, for example, in Japan. We'll, we'll get to them in a minute. But you have these different Buddhist temples, right? Where Chan is also gonna be inside there as well. But unlike we might think as Westerners as, oh, just Zen or something like that, that's all you practice. That's just like one of many different practices they may actually practice in that temple. And you also have temples there that may focus on a particular function, maybe it's monastic ordination, maybe as meditation, different things like that, but they don't really see themselves separate and necessarily as independent separate schools when it comes to Buddhism. Now, as we progress, uh, the years and centuries are going by, you start to see a spread. And so the spread goes to Vietnam, it also goes to Korea, where you get to see it called by different things, but essentially it's just Diana, this specific practice is spreading out towards all of East Asia. The last country really to get this was Japan. So you had transmissions kind of going back and forth, right? But then it was, you had one monastic who brought it over from China. And really what we see inside Japan, a little bit you can say like how it got brought into China, where it's been influenced not so much by Taoism there, but now by maybe Shintoism, for example, inside Japan. But it's still a separate thing. But you also have, I think specifically when it comes to Japan, where it's actually separate schools. So it's actually a separate school from other forms of Buddhism, such as Pure Land inside Japan, where you don't have that inside China. So eventually, like in China, you see Chan and Pure Land are basically kind of fused or, or practice together. It's not really looked at as separate schools or anything else like that. It's just Chinese Buddhism. That's it. And you get to see that throughout you know, the rest of East Asia as well to various degrees, for example, in Vietnam. So you don't really get to see, oh, there's a separate Zen school or there's separate pure land school. It's just practice together. And I think before I kind of continue with Japan, you look at, uh, for example, Chinese Buddhism. So you have 
pure land there, pure land practice, which a Westerner may or may not be familiar with, but it's extremely popular, especially with the, the laypersons th throughout mo most of Buddhism. And then you also have Chan, which is also very accessible to laypersons, especially in China and East Asia. It's really kind of when you get to Japan, it gets kind of a little different, but going still keeping with, with China, you get to see where pure land, the practice of reciting and focusing on the, the Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, is really a form of meditative concentration practice as well. So you see this blending of what we may consider two separate Buddhist schools as not really being so separate. They're actually practiced together, which I think is a really not only fascinating, but a, a wonderful practice. You're getting essentially two schools together and you're practicing it in different ways. It's a very much a very whole practice for millions and millions and millions of Buddhists uh, around the world, but especially China and East Asia. But in Japan, it got kind of broken off. So maybe you're practicing Pure Land or you're practicing Zen. So you actually have these separate schools and they're not intermingled in that particular way. Now, when we're, we're looking at Zen or whatever you want to call it, Chan, Zen, etc., we sometimes think of this as Zen Buddhism or a separate particular school or even branch of Buddhism, but it's part of Mahayana Buddhism. No matter whether you call it Zen, Chan, etc., it is Mahayana Buddhism. So sometimes the Western Westerners' interpretation of what they see traditionally because of what got brought over after World War II from Japan, which is really how we're, we're mostly familiar with it, we kind of see this kind of secularized and really toned down version of this meditation school, where it's kind of like stripped away to kind of like appease uh, Westerners, right? But that's not really what you get to see as you get further and further in. So whether it's the actual scriptures, remember I talked about this is a practice that's mind to mind beyond the scriptures. There's a lot of scriptures inside Zen Buddhism. It's, it's part of Mahayana. They revere scriptures as well. It's extremely important part of it, but you also have the supernatural, you have practices, super mundane Buddhism, uh, the Bodhisattva path, all of that. You have all of that that's in Mahayana is part of Zen or Chan because guess what? It's part of Mahayana Buddhism. It is not separate. So that actually shocks a lot of Westerners like, well, I didn't know that was all part of it. I thought this was just meditation. It is part of Mahayana. Another part of that, a lot of the, oh, this mind to mind, this outside of scriptures, I just gotta meditate. I wanna become enlightened, right? And so this is very much a goal focused thing that Westerners sometimes have. You know, next couple of days or this retreat, I wanna be enlightened by the end of it, right? And they fail to realize how much hard work it is because they look at it like, oh, this instant enlightenment. You know, that's the, the key part of Zen. I can just become instantly enlightened if I, you know, it won't take a lot of times. So I don't have to worry about these lifetimes of, of practice and stuff like that. I can, I can get it done, right? No, it is a lot of hard work. In fact, if you're just starting off as new to this particular type of Buddhism practice, you might be just be spending months and months and months or years just trying to settle your mind, just trying to calm your mind so that you can further progress. So there's many different practices when we talk about this particular practice in Buddhism, where it's you know focusing on city meditation, which is central, but it's calming the mind first, so you can kind of get the, get that insight. But also there's there's riddles, there's the working with teachers, there's the daily activities, the daily life engaging inside there. So there's lots of different things that actually occur inside this form of Buddhism. Now, again, it's all part of Mahayana. So does that mean you're gonna become enlightened? Probably not. So even though we are practicing this form of Buddhism, it does not mean, yes, you're gonna become enlightened in this life. That's it, it's part of Mahayana. So as Mahayanas, we look at countless lifetimes as continuation because we are on the bodhisattva path. The goal, even in Zen Buddhism, Chan, whatever you want to call it, is the same as the rest of Mahayanas, and that is to eventually become a Buddha. So let's say you do become enlightened right now. Okay, guess what? Mahayana uh, branch of Buddhism, you're going to continue on because until you become a Buddha, 
it's not going to really make a difference. So you become a bodhisattva, maybe that's at a higher level, that's a, enlightened as well. But our goal is to liberate, to free all sentient beings as Mahayanas, which includes Zen Chan. So if you're not doing that, you just don't become enlightened and you're done. It's a continuous effort through countless lifetimes, countless eons, countless. So this is something that sometimes shocks a lot of Westerners because they very much, as I mentioned earlier, very much goal focused. And they're almost like, wow, I didn't know there was all this supernatural and Buddhist cosmology and rituals and practices. I thought it was just city meditation. It's not, but it is wonderful because you're getting a lot of different components of Buddhist practice and the Buddhist religion even in Zen Buddhism. So when you go into it, go into it with an open mind because a lot of what we're trying to do inside this form of Buddhism practice is really stop all these notions you have. So even like I mentioned all the scriptures, right? So yeah, it's, it's a practice outside the scriptures because what we're talking about here is even what you're being taught, you are supposed to be challenging that. Not challenging so much like, well, I don't have any faith in, in the Buddhist teachings or, or something like that. But basically you're challenging yourself to kind of break down what we're all trying to do in Buddhism, break down this belief in a permanent, unchanging, independent self, which is causing so many different issues in our lives, especially the three fires of greed, anger, and delusion. Because this is starting to create karma and a cycle of rebirth, etc. All the same things we're all practicing in all forms and all schools of Buddhism. So it's just a, a different way to do it. Now, depending on where you live, you may have particular Zen groups or maybe even uh, uh, temples that, that practice it as well. If you are near a one that practices Chinese Buddhism, you're going to find the intermingling or the fusion of Pure Land in there as well too. Don't be taken back by that. I have a separate video about Pure Land Buddhism, but this is something wonderful. And now as a Westerner, it may seem very unusual to you as something. Go in there with an open mind as much as possible and keep practicing because you're going to find this blending is not only, I would say, not unusual as you start to learn it more, but you're like, this is actually pretty beautiful. I really like how this practice progresses and what I get out of it. Because as I mentioned, you get to see that there's a very much a con meditative concentration portion of pure line, not entirely, but a portion of it is that, and that could really intermingle with the Chan or, uh, portion of it. So I, I wanted to keep this video nice and short because we can go on forever uh, about this particular topic. But if you want to practice this form of Buddhism, absolutely, it's, it's a, a very valid one. We have typically lineages, uh, which is very much emphasized in East Asian Buddhism, whether that's in Zen, Chan, whatever, that, that kind of stem back to show you it's, it's teacher-based, it's transmission-based, mind-to-mind, outside the scripture, so we become Buddhas. So that's very much a key portion of it. But you may be in a particular location where there's just a, a, group, by, a group there and you're meditating that way. That's perfectly fine as well too. The key portion is if you can maybe during vacation or something like that absolutely get to a place where you get to a temple or a short-term retreat or something like that to help you with your practice that'll be very beneficial because a teacher that's that's a good component of this particular practice you need that but i, I definitely recognize that can be very very challenging depending upon where you live and if there's nothing close by do you have any questions about chan zen buddhism the meditation school i'd love to hear from you in the comments below thank you